So let's spend some time having done some reading related to handling radioisotopes and different common radioisotopes that we see um, in the imaging department and therapeutic isotopes as well. Let's talk a little bit about what happens if these things get inside of us. So um, I want to illustrate some different types of radionuclides and discuss um, common notations, the way that we notate these uh, isotopes. So this will largely be a review for nuclear medicine, but uh, just bear with us. We are going to chart the activity of radioactive decay, so we'll talk about different decay processes. Um, and then we're going to solve some problems related to activity, decay, and half-life. This is helpful for us in x-ray because it is exactly the same calculation as what we do for half-value layer for shielding, um, and also for quality factors. And then we're going to discuss some factors in committed dose and MERD calculations, and basically my purpose for bringing in that stuff is just to scare the bajinkins out of you in terms of internal dosimetry so that you understand how significant it is um, if we ingest a radiopharmaceutical. So let's, nuclides is a generic term. Um, if we aren't certain about whether it's radioactive or what, we can just call it a nuclide. Um, and it can describe, we can describe it by specifying the number of protons or the atomic Z number. We could also describe it by the number of neutrons. And we could also describe it by the total number of protons and neutrons. That would be the atomic mass number. When it comes to symbolizing nuclides, um, there's three different uh, common ways that they are symbolized. Uh, the first is that we may just refer to it as its actual elemental name, like with, uh, with the case of hydrogen. So if hydrogen has just the one proton, we would call that H1. All right. If we add an additional neutron to the hydrogen, we have deuterium, and so that's going to be one proton plus one neutron, and so you can see the little uh, mass number has gone up, and we would refer to that mass number and referring to it as H2. Tritium is uh, radioactive, um, very commonly occurring radioactive element. It would be H3 in this instance. It would have the one proton, because it's still um, hydrogen, with the addition of two neutrons. And so it's trying to become stable by getting rid of, get rid of those neutrons. So there are three different types of nuclides, isotopes and it has a P in it, so they have different numbers of protons. I'm sorry, different nuclides with the same number of protons. Um, so H1, H2, and H3 are, are all isotopes. They have the same number of protons, but they are um, different nuclides. Isotones are different nuclides with the same number of neutrons. So H3 and helium-4, lithium-5 um, have the same number of neutrons. So the N in isotones. And then isobars, you just kind of have to memorize. These are different nuclides with the same atomic mass number. Maybe one way to memorize that is imagining it like a weightlifting bar or something. They have the same weight, roughly. The chart of the nuclides. If you go to the back of the nuclear medicine uh, classroom, you will see a very large periodic table, much larger than the normal periodic table, uh, much, much larger. Um, and it is charting all of the stable um, elements in addition to all the various uh, nuclides 
both radioactive and non-radioactive that can be derived from those stable elements. So I'm going to zoom in on this real quick. This is roughly what the chart looks like. And the only reason I want to zoom in on this is each one of these squares is colored in ways specific to how it decays. Um, and then there is a line there. You can kind of see a dark line. We call that the line of stability. That's what all of these nuclides are trying to arrive at, is they want to land somewhere on that line of stability. They do not care if they become a different element in that process. They do not be care if they become radioactive or give off radioactive energy during that process. They are just trying to reach stability and so they will go through various decay processes to get to that line of stability. So it works very differently from a normal uh, chart of the periodic table. right? Gases can, can become solids and solids can become gases and things can actually turn into gold. right? Um, through radioactive processes. So the most basic thing this chart does is distinguish from the, the stable nuclides from the radionuclides by the use of colors. So the stable stuff is the nice gray color, nice and boring line of stability. Um, and then the various radioactive things have different colors assigned to them. So radioactive decay, the radionuclide changes the number of protons and neutrons to a more stable combination. It becomes a different nuclide. It, often it becomes a different element altogether. Some of the mass is converted into energy, and this always represents a movement towards that line of stability. Elements are lazy. They are, will give off energy only if it's going to let them be more stable. They do not give off energy and then become more energetic. So the major types of decay are beta decay, and sometimes we call that beta negative. One way to think about this is an electron is born from the nucleus. So beta, born, beta negative, an electron is born from the nucleus. Um, and the, in that process, a neutron is converted into a proton. So if you think about a neutron being having a negative charge, it's almost like an electron married a proton, right? And they canceled each other out. So when beta negative decay occurs, that neutron gives off the electron and in consequence becomes a proton. So we will call that beta negative decay. I'm trying to make this as simple as possible for us. As a result, it's going to move one box up and to the left. So it moves up and over towards the line of stability. So beta negative, when we look at that big periodic table of nuclides, it's going to represent a movement of something below the line of stability. It's trying to get up towards the line of stability. And if you think about that, that's definitely would be the case with the periodic table as well. If we add a proton, we've moved up in the periodic table as well, which is what's happening in beta decay. Um, alpha decay. A particle is emitted that is essentially a helium nucleus, which means it has two protons and two neutrons. It does not have any electrons. It is just a chunk of matter that's emitted from the nucleus. These have to be very, very large elements that do this. Um, there's very few alpha emitters that have an atomic n mass number less than 83. And in this form of decay, it's going to move diagonally down to, to the left. So it's not going to get it it's going to get it just a little bit closer to the line of stability, but if you look at the way the line of stability tracks, this is almost kind of a parallel shift. It loses energy, and it loses a lot of energy, um, but it does not help it become that much more stable. So there, most alpha decays, uh, in fact, all alpha decays that I know of, 
have further radioactive decays that will occur after them. So it has now become yet another radioactive element. Um, positron decay, sometimes called beta positive decay. So a positron is a positive electron. It has the same mass as an electron. Um, Richard Feynman, I believe, said that it's possible that a positron is an electron moving backwards in time. Um, it's a very short-lived particle. It is born in the nucleus, and in this case, if you can think about it, a proton, if we said that a neutron is a marriage between a proton and an electron, we can think about a proton as a marriage between um, a neutron and a positron, right? So it's going to, this proton is going to give off a positron and in the process become a neutron. So it's going to move down an element on the periodic table. And the same thing happens in terms of the line of stability. It's going to move diagonally down and to the right. So uh, positron decay happens to those elements that are north of the line of stability. And our favorite one uh, is the, uh, was it fluoride 18 that decays by positron decay? So, hence, positron emission tomography, PET scans. In the case of electron capture, the nucleus actually sucks an electron into the nucleus, and there's a proton that's converted into a neutron. So, we said that a proton or neutron could be thought of as the marriage between a proton and an electron. That's exactly what happens in electron capture. It, the atom sucks an electron into the nucleus, marries that electron to a proton, and it in turn becomes a neutron. So we go down on the periodic table, and we also move down towards the line of stability. It's interesting to note that both positron decay, beta positive decay, and electron capture have the same consequence in terms of moving the element towards the line of stability, but they're very, very different um, processes. We also have elements that simply emit a gamma ray, and we like those. Because there's none of this gross particle stuff happening, or weird stuff where elements become different elements. They just have a surplus amount of energy, they give it off as a high energy photon, and move to a lower energy. <clears throat> this can happen after decay, where the nucleus is decayed and continues to have additional energy and gives off some of that energy in the form of a gamma ray. And I think that's all I need to say about that. Okay. Here's the part that scares most of us when we are in our first trimester in the program. Activity, decay, and half-life. I've tried to put all this stuff onto a single slide and make it make as much sense as possible. Okay? Um, activity. Well, and already I've not helped us very much because there should be sub-Ts and sub-Ns on this. Um, I apologize. Uh, all of these things should be little tiny guys. The N and the T. Okay. Um, activity is the rate of decay, so it happens over an amount of time. And we can specify the radionuclide, and we know we are able to say what its activity is. It's also listed on that. Uh, periodic table of the nuclides. Probability is a big part of this. So decay is a stochastic process, meaning it's random in nature, um, but it happens over time. And so we think about it with, uh, with this lambda sign indicating the probability in which decay will occur over a given amount of time. 
And sometimes we write that in inverse time, meaning it might, it might say seconds to the negative one or per second. So since this is messed up the way my slide is written, it might say second to the negative one, right? That's just a fancy way of writing second below the line or per second. It's also a way of saying that this is going to, that probability and time are both factors um, in decay. Finally, half life or T one half, and a lot of times that's written as T sub one half. Apologize for the program. Um, is the time required for um, the activity of a given radioactive sample to decrease to by half its initial value, and that should be I'm sorry A sub zero, right? So that's the initial activity, the activity at time zero, right? No time has elapsed. This is the first reading that we got. No time has elapsed. The half-life is the amount of time required to reduce that activity by half. Right? Um, here's what I would take away from this. Okay? It's kind of a funny thing. So anyone who stayed and watched the Chernobyl video right, um, or the video about nuclear power, um, how active decay is occurring is not necessarily a good thing. So a lot of times on these videos they talk about this thing has a half-life of thousands of years, right? That actually is kind of good news. That means it does not decay that rapidly. It takes its thousands of years to decay. So it's even though it decays and it has tremendous energy when it gives off it, when it, as it decays, it's not that active. The stuff that we need to worry about as human beings is the stuff that decays pretty rapidly, right? Because it's very active, it's rapidly decaying. The likelihood of it decaying while I'm standing by it is very, very high, right? When it decays... Um, it gives off all of that energy, right? So that is that activity thing. The other thing that I want to talk about very, very basically is what the half-life means for us and why it's important, why we're even talking about it right now. Well, I've said it's directly related to a half-value layer. So let me, let me zoom in here. Zoom in a whole lot so I have a whiteboard. The HVL. This, for us in x ray and in radiation therapy, um, is the way that we measure quality of photons, right? So, how much quality a given photon has is best measured by the half-value layer. Now, nuclear medicine has to think about half-value layer as well. Mathematically, these concepts are equivalent. They are exactly the same concept, okay? And so I'm going to make them as simple as I possibly can, right? One half-value layer. Equals half of the amount, right? One half the original amount, which also equals one half life, right? Are you tracking with me? I put this on a separate slide so that we can see these numbers. Here it is mapped onto exponential decay. So here's another concept that tends to scare us. But what we're just saying is that the stuff falls off really rapidly. So as more time goes by, or as we add more attenuators to shielding, we see an exponential drop-off in the amount of energy. So here again would be that activity at A sub-zero, 
and then here is uh, time. Here's the uh, de here is the energy over here on this side. Energy and time down here. So over time, the energy falls off precipitously, which is good news. Now, some of us hate thinking about that kind of stuff, and uh, and already I can tell you this. This is this is a correctly expressed on your PowerPoint slides if you're following along on the PowerPoint slides. It is not necessarily correctly expressed here. But it is in a formula that where you can plug in um, time and it can tell you what the amount of activity would be over that given amount of time. Now, nuclear medicine, y'all have to do that, right? Um, that's an expectation for you. That is not really an expectation for us in x-ray or in radiation therapy. They do want to make sure that we understand this concept. So I'm going to show you the kind of counting on fingers way of doing this, okay? Um, because this is what's helped me survive both the x-ray and radiation therapy boards. Any question that had to do with activity or radioactive decay, this is how I handled it. Um, it's really, really grade school. I've said that one half value layer equals one half, right? So if I have a single um, half-life that we're talking about, or a single half value layer, I just take whatever that initial value was and multiply it by 0.5, or divide it by one half. Does that make sense? That's going to give me what the resultant half is. So if the initial energy was 4, I just divide that in half, I have 2. That could have been 1, 4 energy, photon incident on a half value layer of, of cement, or it could be one um, half-life of a radioactive element that gives off a four, that has an energy of four, um, four millicuries or whatever. Are you tracking with me so far? Is this making sense? So if it's two half-lives, it's going to be half of half, 0.25. So that would be two half-lives or two half-value layers. I would just multiply whatever I had by 0.25. If I want to get even more grade school, I could just take the four, right? I started out with four, half of that is two. Take half of two, that's one. So two half-value layers, I would wind up with a quarter of what I had originally. I will say there is a radioactive substance that has, that gives off 0.5 sieverts per hour of energy. How, and its half-life is X. What will its energy be after two half-lives? Right? So if there's a radioactive material, point source material, that has a energy that it's giving off of two millisieverts per hour. And it's three half-lives later. What is it giving off now? You tracking with me? And for the most part, I am only interested in these numbers up to four half-lives. And that's been the case with every registry question I've ever seen on this material as well. Um, so you can either memorize decay constants in the exponential decay process, or you can simply memorize these, multipl these multipliers. And if the question says two half-lives or two half-value layers, um, you're going to multiply by 0.25. If it says three half-lives or three half-value layers of cement or whatever, you multiply by what? Awesome. If it says four half-lives or four half-value layers, either one, I've said they're equivalent, it's going to be the 0 0.0625. You just multiply the number by that multiplier, and it will give you um, what the resultant uh, final activity is. Whether we're talking about half-value layers of shielding or half-lives of radioactive decay.
Okay, so let's talk about how this stuff affects the insides of our body. We can't directly measure this junk, which is the bad news. Um, we have to calculate it. And generally, we do not calculate it on this Texas Instruments or Casio scientific calculator. The calculations required are some of what we're talking about when we talk about simulation for radiation therapy treatments. Um, they're three-dimensional. They're even four-dimensional because they're occurring over a certain amount of time at a certain activity rate. And they're happening in specific organs, and each one of those organs has its own um, tissue weight, right? So if you can imagine with me for a minute, um, I've inhaled some radon gas, right? When I inhale that radon gas, it goes into my lungs. It does not necessarily go into my kidneys. So I have to think about how much of that gas has exposed my lungs versus my brain, right? Given the amount of gamma rays that the radon gas gives off in decay processes, what will be the other parts of the body that those gamma rays reach and expose to ionizing radiation? All of that has to be simulated over time, right, based on radon's activity. So, like I said, basically there are two ways that we have to think about internal calculations. There are the physical factors. Those are things like the radioactive decay processes, the amount of energy given off by the radiation when it decays, the type of uh, decay process that it goes through, the radioactive half-life, as well as whether that element um, would exceed, its half-life would exceed the life of the organism that it's inside of. There's some things that if we ingest them, they're just going to say 60 years, right? Um, it doesn't matter. The, the, this element is going to exceed the lifespan of the organism that is inside it. Like, for example, we've talked about the radium watch style painters, those girls who were painting watch styles with uranium paint, or radium paint. They were radioactive when they died, and guess what? Those women, if you dug them up right now, they would still be radioactive. Right? Because the, what they ingested exceeded their own lifespan in terms of its activity and half-life. In addition to that, we have to think about the biological factors of every single tissue in the body. Right? And so you can see why this is not something we can do on a calculator. We're going to need to simulate it on a computer. So we need to think about the distribution of the, of the isotope through the body and the things like different kinetic behaviors that dif different elements have. For example, oxygen behaves differently in the body than carbon dioxide, which behaves differently from calcium, which behaves differently from carbon. Right? So each one of these, if these, iso if these um, elements become radioactive, they would also behave differently in the body based on what we call kinesthetic uh, factors. All of this feeds into a concept that we call effective half-life. And just like how we had two factors that we were thinking about in this eternal dosimetry, both the physical and the biological factors, similarly with this we have two factors that influence the effective half-life. The first is the actual in situ radioactive decay, which means the radioactive decay that occurs in the body, and that's a stochastic process. We've said that it's completely random in nature. We can predict over time um, when the element will be roughly half of its original uh, value, but it might go through 500 radioactive decays um, and then have a period where it goes through none. And then there's also biological elimination, so there's organi organic processes that can influence uh, whether or not we are concerned with an effective half-life. So, for example, the uh, fluoride-18 that we use in PET-CT, a lot of it's just going to be eliminated from the body. The body just gets rid of it, doesn't need it. 
So the effective half-life can never be greater than the shorter of either the biological or the radiologic half-life. So if the body picks up a radioisotope and immediately excretes it in a very short period of time, that is the effective half-life. It was limited by what the biological half-life was. The body had no use for that stuff. So it just got rid of it. It's not in my body to irradiate me anymore. Compare that with, the, again, the radium watch style painters. They ingested radium. The body thought it was calcium, stuck it in their jaw bones. It's still inside their bodies now, even though they're dead, right? It's not going anywhere. It has a very long biological half-life. It also has a very long um, radiological half-life. Are you tracking with me? So all of that combines into what we call a committed dose. And this comes from an ICRP publication. And I'll go ahead and just read it out loud. Radionuclides incorporated in the human body irradiate the tissues over time periods determined by their physical half-life and their biological retention within the body. Thus, they may give rise to doses to body tissues for many months or years after the intake. The need to regulate exposures to radionuclides and the accumulation of radiation dose over extended periods of time has led to the definition of the committed dose quantities. One of the reasons I'm stressing this with y'all um, is because I'm not as concerned with the nuclear medicine people. Y'all are just kind of crazy to work around this stuff, and that's fine. I salute you for that. I think it's cool. Um, but for the nuke med and x-ray tech folks in the audience, there will be times when someone, a manager, says hey, you know, you've got an RT behind your initials, and that we've got this weird radiopharmaceutical thing that we want to do. You can be there to help supervise that, right? And the answer is no. The answer is just no. That is, you can very clearly say that is not my role. I don't, don't say I don't understand how that stuff works because I've just told you how that stuff works, right? And that just, then they'll just, They'll just steamroll you. Oh, this joker, he just needs to read his books again, right? Don't say I don't understand it. Say I understand it, and I understand how risky it is what you are saying. And if you do it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow the whistle on you to the appropriate federal authorities, right? Because you will be asked to, to do this stuff. To, I've worked at, I don't know how many different facilities, but... Roughly a quarter of those facilities at some point in time in my employ asked me to do this kind of stuff. And that's why I'm sharing it with you. I was too young the first time it happened to realize this is not appropriate. And it's not, I do not need to be handling this. Um, and I'm grateful that I wasn't actually in the room when a spill occurred and someone wound up with this. A medical assistant wound up with this. From a, from a therapeutic level, radiopharmaceutical. So something that was used to treat cancer. A significant radiation emitter. And she now has a committed dose. As she's sitting there with her kids, as she's driving down the road, she is radioactive, right? Why? Because someone said, hey, you've got these initials behind your name. You can handle an injection, right? Yeah, I can handle, like, taking a blood draw or something, but not this. Are you tracking with me? Someone's going to ask a good quarter of you to go beyond your role on this stuff. And so I'm telling you, don't do it. Don't say, I don't understand it. Say, I understand perfectly what you're asking me, and what you're saying is incredibly risky. You may not understand yourself just how risky it is what you're proposing. If they have questions, you can refer them back to that PowerPoint slide and the International Commission on Radiologic Protections. Um, okay, so the way that we quantify that is with a city or committed effective dose. This is very similar to the TEDI or a total effective dose. The committed effective dose is the sum of the products of all of the committed organs or tissues um, 
all those different equivalent doses and the appropriate tissue weighting factors. And then we uh, look at that over time. This commitment period, if the, if the half-life is shorter than this time, or I think it's actually six or seven half-lives, if six or seven half-lives are shorter than this period of time, then we calculate based on six or seven half-lives. But for most of this stuff that we're talking about, we're talking about the rest of your life, right? So for adults, we just go ahead and just say times 50 years. For kids, we say times 70 years, right? Because, like, again, this stuff is going to outlive you. So this is similar to the effective dose, but the committed effective dose is used to demonstrate compliance with dose limits and is entered as the dose of record for occupational exposures used for recording, reporting, and retrospective demonstration of compliance with regulatory dose limits. What the heck is that saying? That's saying that if you agree to go and participate in that nuclear medicine therapeutic isotope um, injection and you become contaminated, right, they are going to enter your total dose amount on your exposure records. In other words, you might be out of a job, right? Um, because when they enter that committed effective amount, it could very easily exceed your annual dose occupational exposure limit in just one moment. Because that's what you're, that's what you, is inside, and that's what's going to stay there. So the way that we um, think about that in terms of what the dosimetrists are going to do is use something simple like a MERD calculation or um, some kind of simulation that approximates this. And it's just a way of standardizing uh, these calculations of internal dose. So basically, it's going to take the dose, and it's going to say that that's equal to the energy absorbed in the tissue of interest divided by the mass of the tissue. So they have these big, big tables that they apply everything to. Um, and the MERD, maybe one big takeaway to think about with this is the MERD is going to divide the body into source organs and target organs, meaning that, say again, I've inhaled that radon, it's in my lungs. That is the source organ now. It is the organ that's giving off radioactivity. If some of those gamma rays hit my liver, then that, the liver is now a target organ. It has been influenced by the source organ radioactivity that's coming out of my lungs. There's five steps, basically, for calculating this stuff. We will determine the biological distribution an effective half-life of the radionuclide. Then we're going to look up the rate of energy emitted by the radionuclide in the source organs, so every single possible organ it could be inside of. And then we're going to calculate the fraction of emitted, emitted energy absorbed by the target organ tissues and compute the total amount of energy absorbed in the target organs, and then we're going to divide that by the whole mass of the whole body. You do not need to memorize all these steps. I just want to point out to you how calculate how complex this single calculation would be, right? Um, <clears throat> and it is yet again to emphasize um, how serious we need to take working with radioisotopes. <clears throat>